In today's episode, we're going over a case study of a patient post-operative ACL reconstruction, and we're also going to go over her pre-op rehab. Let's get it rolling. First and foremost, thank you. Thank you so much for watching and supporting me. You truly allow me to do what I love for a living. My name is Dan Pope. I'm a physical therapist, coach, and meathead. I love all things fitness tremendously. It's been my biggest passion since I was a little guy, right? This is the Fitness Pain-Free Show, where we help coaches and physical therapists like you get your patients out of pain and back to training. If you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that like button. It helps me out tremendously. It sounds really stupid. And, you know, when I am watching YouTube, I very rarely hit the like button. Uh, I should more frequently because it helps me out. Okay. Uh, please comment if you have any questions and then subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And then if you're listening or watching this via podcast, yes, there's a video podcast up on Spotify. Please leave me a positive rating and review. That again helps me out tremendously. If you want to go that extra step and support me further, consider subscribing to Insiders. It's a comprehensive educational resource and toolkit for the fitness and rehab professional. I think Netflix, but for trainers and physical therapists. It's premium content from me. I've been updating this for five plus years. There's over 100 webinars, ebooks, and complete guides. You have access to a private Facebook group. So if you have any questions, I'll answer those. You can also decide upcoming podcast topics. I've gotten a lot of really good topics from you guys over the course of time, which has been a lot of fun. Uh, and you get started for just $1. It's kind of ridiculous how cheap it is, right? I'm probably going to bring that price up in the future. And you can cancel any time. So if you're interested, I'll put a link in the show notes, but you can also go to fitnesspainfree.com, go to programs and click on Fitness Pain Free Insiders Online Library to get started. Just so you know, this is part three of a three-part series on ACL or reconstruction rehabilitation. So if you haven't checked out part one or part two, definitely check that out. And if you already had, great, you're in the right place. Let's get moving. Before we get started today, I want you guys to download the evidence-based guide to exercise after ACL reconstruction. So I'm in a really nice infographic that's going to help you out with all of your patients when you're trying to figure out which exercise to give them and how to advance them over the course of time. I'll put that link in the show notes. We go over why do we care about exercise selection after ACL reconstruction, how to dose exercise for ACL reconstruction patients, and also when is it safe to start open chain knee extensions, okay? So link in the show notes, definitely check that out. It's going to help you out tremendously, okay? Free resource, go grab it. So how do things change once we get to week six, moving forward for range of motion? So at this point, range of motion is as needed, okay? So what does that mean? At the start of each session, I assess knee range of motion, I see where it's at, and then we do treatments on that based on what's limited. Soft tissue mobilization, patellar mobilization, passive range of motion with overpressure, supine extension with overpressure like we talked about before, or seated knee uh, flexion range of motion, okay? I always like to follow this up with some self-dynamic mobility for the patient to try to um, reinforce that new range of motion we just built, okay? And the thing is, the amount of range of motion that I do over the course of time generally ramp ramps down unless someone is really stiff, okay? Uh, I find that the folks that are really good about doing their mobility, they definitely are getting to the point where we can ramp down at this point, uh, but some folks that don't are still very stiff and they still need to do quite a bit of range of motion work at week six. So again, it's going to depend on the individual quite a bit. Some people just do better than others, right? So sometimes it's not that you're not doing enough mobility. It's just that it's a stiffer person and not progressing at the same rate as someone else. And sometimes you need to Tell folks like, hey, you're, you need to do your home exercises because that certainly happens, right? Folks will be decent patients when they come in to see you, but they're not putting the time and effort in. Um, you can also make the decision to see the patient more. So if you're starting to see like, you know, we went down to one a week because you were doing quite well, but now you're pretty stiff. I recommend bumping back up to two per week. Um, you can do that. And I certainly have done that. So see how the patient is doing. If they need more range of motion, more time spent doing it, then do it. But if they're getting better, you just don't need to do it quite as much, right? So you make a decision based on how they're progressing. In terms of strength, what are we starting to add? This is a pretty fun time for the patients, right? Because we're introducing some more challenging strength, and they're starting to feel like they can actually exercise again, which is pretty nice. So week six, after we finished our kind of transition week, when we did our weight bearing, right, and we started to do gait training, I start to introduce single-legged strength, okay? And my favorite exercises for single-legged strength are going to be single-legged squats, single-legged deadlifts, right, some sort of step up, and usually some sort of split squat, okay? And here's the thing. The split squat or the lunge, the forward lunge and the reverse lunge have all been shown to have very little stress on the ACL graft. Okay. However, they're looking at the front side leg and in the front side leg, you have the hamstring and the quad working together, which is going to reduce stress via co-contraction on the ACL graft. 
but on the backside leg, the trail leg, the quad's very active and the hamstring is not. Okay. So if you think about a split squat, the trail side leg is very similar to an open chain knee extension and probably puts more stress on the ACL graft. Okay. So one of the things that I'll do oftentimes is I introduce single legged squats, single legged deadlifts and step ups, because I know it's very low stress on the graft. And oftentimes I'll wait until week seven to introduce a split squat because I know that we're putting a little bit more stress on that backside leg. If you want to be really cautious, you could hold off on that split squat until week 12, right? Um, I don't know that we need to do that, but just keep in mind that this is something that's not talked about frequently, but the backside leg of a split squat or lunge is stressed very similar uh, for the ACL as an open chain knee extension. Okay. When we introduce single legged exercises, we start with partial ranges and oftentimes assisted. So we've got a, a picture of my patient here and she's doing a partial range step up and she's utilizing a very short box as you'll see, and she's using a TRX for assistance. So I'd much rather start with an easier variation with good form okay, and not aggravate the knee. And over the course of time, we can always make this more challenging. We're also looking for compensation. Okay. So the same strategy applies. If you have access to a force plate, great. You can use that to see if they're transitioning weight onto this leg. Well, we can use a mirror, right? We can also use video biofeedback. So I'll often take a video of the patient and just show them like, Hey, your knee is not translating anteriorly. You're sending all your weight back to your hip. Let's try to drive that knee forward just a little bit. Because when you do a step up with the other side leg, the knee is coming forward a lot, but not on that surgical side. Okay. I'll also use a bench for biofeedback. So if someone is doing a step up or a split squat, I'll actually put a bench in front of their knee and I'll ask them to reach the knee toward the bench on the surgical side because folks that just had a knee surgery, they don't like to load up that knee. They don't like to bring the knee over the toe or beyond the toe. I will actually give them a bench to reach toward to give that cue so that they actually load up the knee a bit more, load up that quad. So week six to 10, we're still continuing direct knee isolation strength work. Okay. And this is for the quads, but also the hamstrings. The hamstrings are going to be weak. And if you're working with someone that had a hamstring graft, keep that in mind. That's also going to be weak as well. Um, do keep in mind, this was not a hamstring graft. Okay. So when we load up the hamstring after a hamstring graft, it's not the same as when we have a cadaver graft. Okay. In terms of the exercise we're using for the quads, we increase the challenge of the exercise. So most of the exercises we started with were table exercises, okay? Now we're uh, transitioning into weight bearing. And one of my favorite exercises for weight bearing quads are heel taps. I'll do a heel tap with a terminal knee extension. So I add the two together. I like to try partial uh, sissy squats with a terminal knee extension, which is basically a squat where you really push the knees forward. I also like heels elevated goblet squats for the same reason. If you elevate the heel, it's going to force that knee forward, which is going to make the quad work a bit more. Uh, you do have to be cautious with these. They can create quite a bit of knee irritation. I do find that in folks after ACL reconstruction, they end up with other pain problems. So it's not just that you're irritating, like, I don't know, the prior ACL or you're irritating that meniscus or whatever was injured within the initial injury. You might be creating some patellofemoral pain just because you have a weak quad and you're deconditioned. So you have to be cautious with how much stress you throw at that knee and not just the graft. Okay. We're also continuing to work the accessory muscles. So we're working the core, working the hips, working the calves, and we're doing our blood flow restriction training one or two times a week. Okay. So here's the thing. BFR is phenomenal for the early stages of rehabilitation. And the reason being is because early on with rehab, we can't load up that area with heavy weights. Okay. And we can get a similar improvement in strength and hypertrophy by adding BFR without the load. Okay. As someone progresses and they're able to handle more load and more power and more school skill specific work, we actually start to phase out the BFR. Okay. It's still a nice ancillary and I'll often keep it in the mix, but do keep in mind that BFR is more for the beginning stages of rehab. It's not really used for the advanced stages, although I think you can make a case for it. Okay. And the other piece is that we're working on balance and neuromuscular control. A lot of um, single-legged balance on unstable surfaces with perturbations, kind of like we did uh, prior to surgery, okay? Also keep in mind is that your ACL is important for proprioception of the knee, okay? And you lost your ACL, and now you have a new ACL, so you have to restore that proprioception again. So the balance is actually quite important, okay? And quite important from a perspective of reducing re-injury rate as well. 
So what do off days look like? We went through our strength days, but what are we doing on our off days, right? So I actually like to do some direct quad isolation work. Uh, we just keep the intensity lower, all right? It's kind of like recovery days for the quads. We don't want to beat the quads up too much, but the more volume you throw at the quads, generally speaking, the more improvements you're going to get in strength and hypertrophy. So if we can add a little extra, great. Uh, the off days are also a great uh, time to really hammer in on range of motion as needed. I also tend to do my conditioning work on non-strength training days. Uh, for her, we worked our way back up to 45 to 60 minutes, you know, of cycling at a kind of a low to moderate intensity. And then in terms of walking, um, if we were trying to get back to a return to run program, I would start to progress walking at this point to do more and more steps. Okay. However, we're not really trying to get back to return to running. So this wasn't quite as important, but this would be on my radar somewhere between week six and 10. If I am planning on getting someone to a return to run program, somewhere between three and four months. Right. So here's where things start getting a little more fun. What are we doing rehab wise week 10 to 14? So for one, from a strength perspective, we keep the frequency the same. Three times a week, we're doing strength work, okay? We're continuing to load up our bilateral strength. So we started off introducing these movements with no weight, okay? Focused on symmetry. Now we're actually adding a bit more load, okay? So previously, we're doing more goblet squatting. We're adding a little bit of load via goblet squatting. We're using heavier weights, and eventually we transition over to a front squat. We started off with a kettlebell RDL, right? So lighter loads, and we progress our way to a trap bar, trap bar deadlift, Okay. We're also loading single-legged strength more. So we're using more load and increased range of motion. We also start working a little bit into the frontal plane with movements like lateral deadlifts. Of course, we're watching for compensation still, right? This is going to be something that's always on our radar, but hopefully it's improving over the course of time. So we can use mirror, mirror biofeedback. I take a lot of videos of my patients, all right, just to show them where I think they're compensating and then show them how to correct that with cueing, right? And you can also continue to use the force plate for biofeedback. However, I start to transition away from the force plate over the course of time as we've just shown that we can create symmetry. And we just go to like a, a standard a lifting platform, right, and squat in front of the mirror, okay? At this stage... I start to prepare the athlete for plyos, okay? I'm not throwing plyos at, at my athletes until around week 14-ish, right? But we're starting to think about it, right? And the way I start to prepare my athletes for plyos is all the single-legged strength we've been doing, but also by incorporating sled work. And I start by working in the sagittal plane. So we do a forward sled push. If you think about the position of a forward sled push, it's very, very similar to accelerating. And we also do a backwards drag, which is very similar to backpedaling. Okay. Except we do it slowly. So it's not the same amount of force quickly through that knee joint as with running, jumping, changing direction. At week 12, we start to progress towards more sideways or frontal plane work with the sled. So I do things like lateral shuffles as well as a crossover step with the sled, which I think is phenomenal for change of direction, right? We're mimicking those same positions we have to do with change of direction work, but we're doing it slowly because we have a sled with some load on it and it's not super fast and aggressive on the knee. We're going to continue directly isolating knee strength, okay? But I think what's important at this point is you should probably strength test your athlete, okay? So seated knee extension, seated knee flexion. You can also make an argument for testing hip strength because the hip is obviously important in these folks, right? And then you will prescribe accessory strength based on what's limited, okay? So if the quad is still really weak, we got to make sure we work on it. But if the hamstring is really weak too, we have to start to focus on that as well, Okay. Generally, what I do is that if I have an athlete that's weak, weak into, let's say, knee flexion, so we find the hamstring is actually quite weak, I work that three days per week, all right? The quad is almost always something we continue focusing on after ACL reconstruction, but moving forward, I start to make decisions on my accessory exercises based on what's actually limited. You can also make the argument for assessing knee strength earlier than week 10. However, I, I do think it's important to keep in mind that if you have a post-op knee and you do, let's say... Um, knee extension strength testing at, you know, let's say post-op day two even, right? And you do that, let's say 70 degrees, that's quite safe for the ACL. However, you may really aggravate the knee, right? So one thing to keep in mind is that these folks are weak because the knee is painful. If we do a test that just irritates the knee more, you know, what's the point of that? We know they're already weak, right? We just continue strength training. So I tend to wait a little bit longer, but I can see how you can make the argument for strength, excuse me, strength testing a bit earlier. Okay. So the other thing we do is we increase the load, increase the challenge of the movements that we prescribe for di direct knee isolation work, right? So I think you can also make the argument that at week 12, you can start loading open chain knee extent, excuse me, open chain knee extensions a bit more, just because we have some research to show that this stage is quite safe 
for the ACL. And the other part is that if you're going to start doing plyometric work soon, then the stress on the ACL with open chain knee extension is definitely less than a lot of plyometric work you're about to throw at your patient. So in terms of the safety of open chain at this point, you know, you're probably fine doing it. All right. I'm not the expert here, but probably fine. So the other thing you can do is very quad dominant closed chain exercises, which are probably a bit safer on the ACL graft. So what would that be? That would be a very heels elevated squat variation or a sissy squat. Uh, that way we are directly isolating the quad in a more closed chain fashion. Uh, do keep in mind that when you drive the knee further forward over the toe, you're going to increase stress on the ACL graft, right? Uh, the next thing is that I made a very in-depth insiders video on exercise prescription for folks that have knee pain or after they've had knee surgery. So if you want to learn a lot more about how to prescribe exercises for the knee, I definitely check out uh, fitness pain for insiders. I'll leave a link in the show note. All right. I would also recommend checking out my last podcast episode where we talked about uh, ACL uh, reconstruction exercise guidelines. Okay. So you can see the way I like to prescribe things based on the stress on the ACL. Uh, but suffice to say, we're just ramping up more and more. So in terms of accessory muscles, so the hips, the core, and the calves, we continue to train these around three times per week. And I'll work these muscles one, maybe two times a week. So if you have three strength training sessions per week, we're not hitting it every single day, but we're making sure that we keep these strong over the course of time. If you notice that one of these accessory muscles is weak, so let's say hip abduction is actually quite a bit weaker, then you can make the argument for keeping that in the program a little bit more. Okay. In terms of blood flow restriction training, we spoke about this earlier. But we're starting to phase out the BFR, you know, in favor of movements that are going to be a little bit more specific to the sport the patient is trying to get back to. So skiing. All right. In terms of balance exercise or neuromuscular control exercises, whatever you want to call them, we're increasing the challenge. I like to utilize water balls and single legged stance. We like these water balls from chaos. And basically you have a patient stand on one leg and reach in multiple planes. The water is very unstable. It's very tough to balance. Okay. You can also have patients stand on things like rocker boards, right? Bozu balls, perturb the board while I do another task, like dribbling a ball against the wall. We like to do other neurocognitive tasks like ball catching. So someone's standing on an unstable surface while they're having a catch. Maybe someone is perturbing the board at the same time. If you want to see someone who's an expert at prescribing these exercises, check out Kevin Wilkes Instagram. He's got like the, the grand master exercise prescriber for these types of movements, right? we also work on neurocognitive training via the blaze pods. So if you never heard the blaze pods are pretty interesting. So I've got an image of blaze pods here. You can have your patient stand up and balance, and then the blaze pods will light up and you want to tap the blaze pod that's lit up and it'll give you different pods to tap on. You can use this later on with some of your change of direction drills. Uh, but suffice to say, we're starting to put neurocognitive tasks into the patient's program and we advance those over the course of time. Now, what is conditioning looking like for this athlete at this point? All right. So this is a pretty fun discussion. Uh, we're doing conditioning three times a week, um, week 10 to 14. And the amount of conditioning you do is going to vary at this point based on the sport. Okay. Now we discussed previously that VO2 max is actually protective for the sport you're trying to get back to, right? So if you're getting back to some sort of field sport, I think VO2 max is, is going to be a, a main thing that you want to focus on for these next several weeks to really build that up. Okay. Now, in terms of how to do this, I like to build volume first. Uh, generally speaking, intensity is a little bit more challenging on the knee joint. So think about sprinting versus jogging. Jogging is, that, is honest, are obviously going to be a little less stress on that joint. So my preference is to build volume first before you start building intensity. So that would mean starting with 15 minutes, working way up to 30 minutes. Uh, we have already worked up to um, 30 to 45 minutes. I think she's actually up to 60 minutes at this point. You can make the argument that it might be a good time to transition over to elliptical work somewhere between week 10 and 12. Uh, I actually couldn't find any research on stress on the ACL graft with elliptical, right? Uh, it may be more stressful on the graft as far as I know. Uh, but you know, from a logical standpoint, it, it think it seems as though walking is probably going to be the least amount of stress followed by elliptical followed by running, but I don't have a research study to support that. Uh, but you can make the argument if you're going to um, eventually progress to running, then transitioning to elliptical from walking is probably a next uh, best step, right? 
I also like to start interval work around week 12. And I do that first with the bike because it's safest, right? We know that the bike is minimal stress on the ACL graft. Uh, a good example of interval work will be three minutes of work that's hard. So I say on three minutes on. Usually that's around a seven or eight out of 10 of rate of perceived exertion, followed by three minutes off, right? At a low intensity, around three to four out of 10. And just cycle those, right? Multiple rounds of that. And then eventually we would start running afterwards. Um, it's just that I, I'm not going in depth here just because this patient is not trying to get back to running. So this was not important for her. What was important for her is getting back to more intensity via cycling, right? So we basically started interval work on the cycle around week 12. We started to transition over to more speed, but we'd already built the volume up. So she was, do, she was doing somewhere between 45 and 60 minutes of, of regular old cycling before we started to increase that intensity. Okay. So just to rehash, I like to prove tolerance to volume before incorporating more intensity. And I like to incorporate intensity via these longer intervals. So three minutes on, three minutes off, and they're just going back and forth between the two, right? So lastly, we're, we're not here yet, right? But how about return to impact and return to more high-level conditioning? I kind of lump these two together. I like to do these three times per week, right? But you can make the argument. You probably want to make sure that quad strength is close to symmetrical before you start doing that because we don't want to have a weak quad before we start going to high level activity. Okay. So you're looking for probably 80% symmetry or more. Um, so for my patient, we haven't gotten to this uh, stage quite yet, but generally what I like to do around week 12 is introduce low level impact. So some ideas for that are going to be easy pogos, easy dynamic warm up, consisting of things like skips, right? Or maybe some sled work. And if you wanted to be really scientific and progressive about this, you can match the amount of contacts that you have, right? With your dynamic warm up, your pogo jumps and sled work with the amount of steps you'll be taking when you run, right? So let's say I'm making these numbers up. Let's say that you are prescribing a thousand contacts in your dynamic warm up, right? And then when you run, you're going to be doing, let's say 1200 contacts. Great. You've done a good job preparing your athlete for that. Okay. Uh, at this point, you can also start with an alter G which is the treadmill that just reduces the amount of body weight that you're actually uh, taking when you run, which is awesome. We don't have one, but this would be something to utilize at that point. Uh, generally speaking, at week 14, we would introduce a return to run program. Uh, this might not occur with this patient because she doesn't want to get back to a lot of running. And lastly, week 16 is when I start to incorporate more agility, impact, and sprints, right? Uh, this is a topic for another day, right? It's also not the right topic for this patient because she's not trying to get back to soccer, but I just want to give you a snapshot of how this would progress over the course of time. So in this slide right here, you can see the patient's exercise at week six, and you can also see the exercise at week 10. I wanted to keep these together because you can see the progression over the course of time. Okay. So if you're, if you're listening to this and you can't see this on YouTube or the video podcast, I'm going to read this out briefly to you. So on day one, we were squatting with a mirror at week six. We progressed that to a goblet squat over the course of time. Our second exercise was a resisted sidestep. Eventually we just added a little load. We did goblet hold sidestep, right? Next exercise, we started with a dumbbell RDL and worked our way to a trap bar deadlift. We also started with single-legged balance with a forward reach, and we just turned that into multi-direction reaching to progress over the course of time. We started our step-ups with a TRX assist, and we worked to a lateral step-up, so working into the uh, frontal plane a little bit, right? We were doing a single-legged calf raise off a step, and we just kept that the same over the course of time. Still a good exercise. And the last exercise was a Spanish squat with a band behind the knees. Over the course of time, we made that more challenging for the quad by adding a heel lift, right? On our day two, we were squatting as well, and then we started to add more load via a goblet. We also had a super clamshell, and we made that more challenging with a band. We started with a dumbbell RDL. We turned that into a kickstand dumbbell RDL. We had a kickstand single-legged squat, and that just turned into a regular single-legged squat, and we eventually added some load. We started with a split squat. We turned that into a reverse lunge. Okay, so increasing the challenge by making this movement more dynamic. We start with a prone hamstring curl. We turn that into a slider hamstring curl, just some more challenging movement. And then we lastly did a heel tap with a knee extension, uh, had a band behind the knee. And over the course of time, you can make that harder just by increasing the, the uh, amount of elevation for the heel tap or increasing the band tension. Okay. And then lastly, our BFR consisted of Spanish squats, a short step up, a kickstand, single leg deadlift, and calf raises. So next, this brings us to our long-term planning, right? So our patient wants to get back to skiing, right? Now, I don't want to return this patient back prior to nine months. 
And this is based on some of the research we have about re-injury rates. So if we're not waiting for at least nine months, we can be into a little bit of trouble. Uh, I don't think it's worth it to do all this work and then risk it, right? So he actually decided to forgo this upcoming ski season because he wants to stay as safe as possible. However, in terms of her long distance cycling, cycling is fair game for the most part. We know that cycling is actually very little stress on the ACL. The only problem is if you fall off the bike, right? So that would be the major risk. Now, the thing is for her, we need to make sure that we ramp up the volume of running because she's, if she's going to be doing a hundred mile race, she needs to be able to tolerate much more volume of cycling, right? The next piece is that you probably have to ramp down the strength too. So as we have any upcoming big cycling races, we probably need to ramp up the volume to prepare for that race, but we need to simultaneously decrease the amount of strength work because it's a competing stress and it might be too much stress for the knee. Okay. So you can see how this is kind of an interesting position to be in for this athlete because she needs to make sure she's preparing for cycling, which is a very different sport than trying to prepare for soccer, right? So in terms of long-term planning, it's super important that you think about the patient that's in front of you, what they have to be able to accomplish, the stress on that knee with that activity, and try to work your way up over the course of time to meet the demands of that sport or activity, right? Pretty simple. So here's what I want you to do next, guys. I want you to go and download my evidence-based guide to exercise after ACL reconstruction. Okay. I made an evidence-based infographic to help you make decisions for your patients after ACL reconstruction. We go over why do we care about exercise selection after ACL reconstruction, how to dose exercise for ACL reconstruction patients, and when is it safe to start open chain knee extension. Okay. I'll leave that link in the show notes. Guys, go check it out and download it. It's free. I highly recommend it. If you guys are interested in any of the references, I'll leave that in the show notes as well. Reference number one is that Delaware ACL Reconstruction Physical Therapy Protocol. So definitely check that out to learn a bit more. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast today. It is truly folks like you that allowed me to do what I love for a living. Uh, if you want to help me out, please hit that like button, comment, and subscribe. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this podcast episode. If you want to help me even more, head over to where you listen to your podcasts and leave me a positive rating and review. I really appreciate it. All right. And then please, if you want to support me that extra step, head to fitnesspainfree.com. Click on that programs link and Fitness Pain Free Insiders Online Library. It's just a dollar for more great learning. So I'll leave a link in the show notes for you guys to get started. Thank you very much.